Welcome. Good morning, church. We're so glad you can join us this morning. If you are viewing us for the very first time, I encourage you to help us get to know you by selecting that QR code in the corner. A form will appear, and you can just let us know who you are. For our regular attendees, we encourage you to share your prayers as well as your praises so that we can just pray and praise with you. This morning, we're going to be starting off with sharing about a few events that are going on at our church. Our Pastors Fellowship continues to meet on Tuesday evenings at 7.30 to 8.30. You can find that Zoom information in your bulletin and also in the midweek. Um, we have something new that's coming up this, this week, is that we are opening up our outdoor facilities for reservations for our small groups. If you want to know more information or find out what's available, please contact rooms at BACBC.org. And as we continue with our partners for, with our church, Foster the Bay, they have a special contest coming up. And so this is open to uh, all ages. No one's too young. No one's too old. And you don't have to have a lot of experience with art. Um, we do encourage you to participate. And the deadline to submit that artwork or find out more information is April 2nd. So you can, again, find that information in our bulletins. Baptismal classes will be available this coming Sundays on April 4th and April 11th for our English. And you can see it, it, will, it will also be available in our Cantonese and Mandarin languages. We are preparing for our Sunday or Saturday, I think, Saturday, April 17th baptismal service. And so we intend to record and show that during our worship services. So again, if you're interested in baptism or know somebody that is, you can have them contact amelia.sun at bacbc.org. Here's a list of what we're going to be um, sharing in the upcoming Sundays. Today, we have a guest speaker, Dr. Aylin Ye. Uh, at the end of our services with him, we are also having a Q&A Zoom session. So you can RSVP if you haven't already through the link that's listed on your site here or going to our bulletin and clicking the link there to access the registration. Uh, the rest of this month, we are in, we're going to be in April. We are now in March still. Um, and so on April 2nd, we have Good Friday services coming up again in all three languages, in English, Cantonese, and Mandarin. In our English services, we will have breakout groups for our LC and YBC groups, as well as a Zoom for our children. So do look forward to that information in the bulletin and in our, in our midweek. April 4th is Easter Sunday. Pastor Steve will be speaking. And then you see all along the rest of the months, uh, we'll continue our series in 2 Corinthians. After our first hour services, we will have a discussion group, so please join us via the Zoom. Uh, there is a QR code there, or you can find the link in our bulletin. And then, so again, just as a reminder, uh, please sign up for the Q&A session today to speak with and share with our guest speaker, Dr. Alan Ye. So as you can see, Easter Sunday is just around the corner. It's next Sunday on April 4th. And so as we prepare, we do have special Easter offerings. Um, this year's Easter offering will be 50% that will go towards reopening of our church, um, as well as just equipment for our online services uh, and PPE. So as many of you know, we have been streaming and recording, and most of our equipment that we have are just in MC1. So we want to prepare all our service venues to be ready for the reopening. The latter 50% will be going towards our brother's memorial service, um, a memorial fund, I'm sorry, Andy Lee's memorial fund. We just want to honor our dear brother and just all the partnerships that he has, um, that he has had uh, along with our church. And so at this time, we're going to be going to our time of offering. Uh, as you can see on your screen, there is a QR code to our push pay. You can find in our push pay um, line items for Easter offering, just for the different ways that you can give, um, but above all for our tithes and our giving to our ministries. And so as we prepare for this time of giving, um, please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we just really thank you for how you continue to bless on our ministries here at Bay Area Chinese Bible Church. We thank you for how you have provided through this time of pandemic, through this time of change and just uncertainty, Lord. Father, we just ask that as you continue to work through these ministries, that you bless on those that are giving in their financial gifts as well as their prayer and service, Lord. Father, we just lay our ministries before you and just ask that you just use uh, these givings uh, for your glory. So, Lord, we lay this time before you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together.
Thank you, worship team, just for preparing our hearts as we move into the time of our sermon and message. This morning, we are so glad that we can have our guest speaker, Dr. Alan Ye, come join us. Um, some of you may remember him from past speaking engagements. Um, he is the Associate Professor of Intercultural Studies at Biola University. He's a lover of movies, food, a marathon runner. Um, he plays the violin, and he likes watching baseball and traveling around the world. I know the last time he came to share with us uh, as staff, he did also share that he just celebrated his five-year wedding anniversary, so he's married, and he had a 17-month-old at the time. And I think it was only last year, November, October 2020, that he had come, so he should have like a two-year-old now, right? Um, so we want to invite him up and uh, have him share with us this morning. So Dr. Alan Ye, take it away. Hello, BACBC. Uh, my name is Alan Ye, and I am a professor of intercultural studies and missiology at Biola University. And uh, I have been at your church before and privileged to have preached there, and I'm really happy to be with you again. Today, I want to be talking about the subject of race. Now, this is a very sensitive topic, and some people say that it's not even found in the Bible. Uh, it is, in fact, all over the Bible. In fact, some might say it's the primary paradigm of the Bible. And so I know this, been, this has become very politicized in terms of people saying this is um, a liberal agenda or uh, this is not uh, really an important or core issue. And I want to say it is uh, not liberal. It is very biblical and it is very core. So I'm going to give you a survey of some Old and New Testament um, texts and then some practical tips on how you can apply these. All right, so here we go. The Bible and race. Well, first of all, I just want to say that the word race is a contentious one today because uh, it has been used in racist ways in the past. Um, you know, the old anthropological categories from the 19th and early 20th century were that the world only had four races. There were Caucasoids, who were white people, Negroids, who were black people, Mongoloids, who were Asian people, and Australoids, who were indigenous people. And... Um, this has been debunked. In fact, if you look in the Bible, uh, it talks about us all being of one race, one human race. Now, that being said, um, the word race uh, has basically come to replace the word ethnicity in sort of vernacular discourse. So I'm going to use it even though it's not totally accurate. But, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a biblical literalist or a uh, Darwinian evolutionist. Everyone believes that all of humanity is one race, uh, started with a single origin, and it's proved in the fact that genetically we can all interbreed. So, but uh, what's important is the Imago Dei. In Genesis 1 27, the cultural mandate says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So, both male and female in all races, um, or originally everyone came from one race is made in the image of God, and that's why we value race, okay? Um, now, the cultural mandate also tells that everyone needs to uh, be fruitful, multiply, and spread over the whole earth. So that was uh, the original command of God to human beings. Now, um, let's start from the Old Testament, and uh, we'll move into the New, but with the Old Testament, um, let's take a look at Noah first. The reason why I want to mention Noah is because... Uh, uh, he had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and these are often used racially. In other words, Ham, Shem, and Ham is seen as the um, grandfather of all Africans, Shem, the grandfather of all Asians, and Japheth, the grandfather of all Europeans, because these three sons of Noah had 72 grandchildren who, in Genesis chapter 10, uh, were the uh, table of nations, the 72 nations. So, uh, and here's the thing. Um, people have used this racially in terms of saying that um, justifying black slavery because the so-called curse of Ham is that uh, Genesis 9, 22 to 27, it talks about Ham, uh, you know, seeing his father's nakedness and Shem and Japheth uh, did what was right and uh, so Noah woke up and said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servant shall he be to his brothers, uh, but blessed be the Lord of, 
be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. So some people have said, well, uh, Ham, because of he, what he had done wrong, uh, is cursed to be a servant of the others. And that justifies black slavery. Well, first of all, I want you to look at the table of 72 nations and to look um, exactly where these um, 72 grandchildren of Ham, Shem, and Japheth reside. Um, first of all, in the biblical text, it doesn't say that Ham is cursed. It says that Canaan is cursed. Secondly, look at where Canaan is. It's right next to Israel. In fact, we see this because uh, the Israelites uh, conquered Canaan. And so it's a prophecy predicting that it is not about black slavery. Okay, let us move on to Genesis 11, um, Tower of Babel. A lot of people think that diversity was a curse because of Babel. Um, human beings were arrogant and therefore God uh, told um, scattered them and um, cursed them with different languages and ethnicities. Um, but if you look actually uh, in Genesis 11:4, the problem is not that uh, they were uh, doing something bad with, um, you know, being of one ethnicity. Uh, the problem is that they did not obey the, gen the cultural mandate from Genesis 1. Because they said, uh, we, we just want to stick together. We don't want to be dispersed over the face of the whole earth, as it says in Genesis 11.4. So, um, it was not a punishment. Diversity was not a punishment. It was a correction. Uh, kind of like uh, Jonah, who refused to go to Nineveh. And God grabbed him and pointed him in the right direction. That was not a punishment on Jonah. And in the same way, when God spread people over the whole earth, he was basically telling them to fulfill what they should have been doing in the first place, which is to create many nations and many ethnicities and many cultures and just go. This is why it's called the cultural mandate in Genesis 1. So at this point, God gets kind of fed up with humanity um, because they're just not doing the right thing. And so the narrative shifts from universal to specific history. And it starts with Abraham and the patriarchs. So this is where we get the beginning of Ju Judaism. Um, and uh, they are the ones chosen to spread over the whole earth. Okay. Uh, now, lest we think, well, then that means only one race is favored. Are the Gentiles second class? Actually, though most Bible heroes are Jews, there's plenty of Gentiles who are Bible heroes as well. And you even see a lot of them in the Old Testament. Adam, Noah, Job, Melchizedek, and even Abraham. Yes, he, although he's sort of the father of the Jews, he, he himself was a pagan for, out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Jews actually didn't start until Judah. Um, so that was actually uh, where they got their name. So uh, Luke was a Gentile, and Timothy was half Jewish, and Ephraim and Manasseh, who are uh, the sons of Joseph, Joseph married uh Egyptian women, and so they're half Jewish, and they're two of the tribes of the Old Testament. And don't forget the women. Um, uh, Zipporah, who was uh, Moses' wife, was a Midianite, uh, and Ruth, Rahab, and Bathsheba are all in Jesus' genealogy, and uh, they, uh, one was a Moabite, one was a Canaanite, and one was a Hittite, which means even Jesus was mixed race. And the Bible is very intent on telling us this, so this is really important. Uh, in fact, I want to highlight Moses' wife for a second. Um, there's this really interesting story in Numbers 12, 1 to 10, where Moses' wife is actually, um, she's a Cushite. She's a black African woman. By the way, just in case you're confused, um, Moses actually had two different wives. Zipporah was one, Midianite, that's from Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, he also had a Cushite wife uh, at a later time. I think one died and then he remarried. But the Cushite wife, Cush is actually Ethiopia. So he had a black African wife at one point. And when Aaron and Miriam criticized Moses for this, um, God made them leprous white as snow. And that's his punishment to them for criticizing her skin color. He made He's like, you want to be white? I'm going to make you white. So... Um, yeah, so I think that's, you know, here's some Old Testament theology of race and how uh, racism just wasn't acceptable. Um, I not only want to talk about race, but I want to talk about immigration. 
because immigration is also an, a, another contentious thing uh, within our country today. Uh, usually race with blacks and usually immigration with uh, Asians and Hispanics. Um, but I want to point out that um, the silliness of uh, discriminating against immigrants because, look, unless you're Native American, you're an immigrant to this land. And unless you're Jewish, you are a Gentile. And in both cases, you are the stranger who is welcomed into this nation and into this faith. So let's not say, uh, well, you know, let's discriminate, discriminate against immigrants because we are strangers both in terms of our ethnicity and in terms of our faith. Um, also, I like to point out that if you're an American evangelical, you also owe your identity to two anti-establishment protest movements, the American Revolution and the Protestant Reformation. So in both cases, historically, you were the outsider who uh, had to be broken in. And then in Romans 9 through 11, Paul is very keen to say, hey, you Gentiles don't get arrogance because if God was not afraid to break off the original people, the Jews, he's like, he could break you off too. So yeah. Now, Immigration um, is actually, in the Bible, the third greatest love commandment. Um, almost every Bible here has some kind of immigration experience. And um, whether it be uh, uh, Paul, who is, you know, traveling all over the place in his missionary journeys, or even Jesus, who uh, fled to Egypt as a political refugee because Herod was trying to kill him, or um, Abraham, who went from Ur of the Chaldeans to uh, the promised land, and those are just three examples of many. So, um, but in the Bible, there's so many verses about how to love the foreigner or the sojourner or the immigrant or the alien. These are all translated differently, but they're referring to the same thing. So, in fact, uh, this is the third greatest love commandment in the Bible. Uh, love God, love neighbor, and then love the foreigner. So, and why do you need to love the foreigner? the foreigner because you once were the foreigner, right? It's this whole thing that I was just talking about. You're a Gentile, you're an immigrant, and therefore you should not uh, deny those who are outsiders. And we see this in Exodus 22, 21, Leviticus 19, 33 to 34. Um, uh, Matthew 25, uh, you know, if you welcome the needy, you're actually welcoming Jesus himself. Um, Malachi 3, 5, don't be mean to people, otherwise you yourself will be judged. Uh, Hebrews 13, 2, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. You might be entertaining angels unawares or Jesus himself, as it says in Matthew 25. And um, cursed be those who deny justice to the sojourner, says Deuteronomy 27, 19. So um, and I think we need to just make sure that we know that immorality and illegality are not the same thing. Um, there are plenty of things that are legal but immoral, like abortion, or in the past, slavery. Um, there are also things that are illegal but moral, like going to a communist or a Muslim country and evangelizing them or smuggling in Bibles. Okay, so I think we need to follow God's laws and not... Uh, the human laws if they come into conflict. Now, if they align, great, but I think we need to not put human laws over God's laws. You know, um, we should also be aware that we as Asian Americans uh, definitely shouldn't be racist uh, towards blacks and Native Americans because uh, we're actually benefiting from the system. Uh, black slavery and uh, Native American land basically Free labor and free land is what made America great, okay? I mean, you're going to get rich and powerful if you have free labor and free land. And we're still benefiting from this today. And so I, I think we need to re realize that even though we didn't enslave anybody or steal the land, that we're actually living on stolen land and we're benefiting from this economic system um, from the past that really literally killed people. All right. Um, and uh, let's look at social justice. Now, I realize this isn't particularly about race, but I do think it is important for us to know um, in terms of just a general concept. 
There are three different biblical ways to look at this. Um, Tim Keller actually points out that the two Hebrew words in the Old Testament, tzedakah, which means righteousness, and mishpat, which means commandment, you tie these together, uh, the, and this is used over three dozen times in the Old Testament, uh, is translated as social justice. So the tzedakah mishpat, the commandment of righteousness. I know tzedakah is often used uh, for spiritual righteousness, but it actually can also be translated as justice. Uh, another way to look at social justice is the great commandment uh, combined with the great requirement. Uh, great commandment, obviously, love God and love neighbor. The great requirement is to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So, and then um, also a third way to look at it is on earth as it is in heaven, uh, Luke 9, 2. That this is what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, that God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. Um, whatever you hope for in heaven, that's what you should pray for to happen now. So if you pray for justice or righteousness or uh, healing of all things, and equality in heaven, then you should try to enact it now. So um, this shows that social justice has three qualities at least. Uh, it is involved with the physical as opposed to the spiritual. It is involved with the present as opposed to the future. And it is involved with equity as opposed to equality. So I think the first two are pretty obvious. I want to unpack equality versus equity. A lot of people don't understand this, and I think this gets at what is important to understand about um, how to enact social justice and race. Um, equality is having the same stuff. Equity is uh, trying to get restitution. In other words, equality focuses on the starting point and equity focuses on the ending point. So uh, let me give you an example of equality versus equity. Let's say there's two people trying to look over a fence uh, and trying to watch a baseball game. And there's one person who's five feet tall and another is six feet tall. Well, they can't, both can't see over the fence. Uh, so you give them both equal size boxes to stand on. Well, what happens? The six foot tall person can now see the game. The five foot tall person still can't see the game. So what do you have to do? you probably need to give the shorter person a taller box to stand on. See, that's equity. Equality would say both receive the same size box. But equity says the shorter person needs a bigger box because they're shorter. And what it does is it takes into consideration context and history and uh, sort of a, it sort of personally tailors things to uh, some people who have less. So um, here's another example of equality versus equity. Um, equality says that um, men and women should have the same size bathrooms in public. But if you look, it's not really fair because women's bathroom lines are always out the door, right? Why is this? Because women have different biological needs. They need to sit down instead of stand up. So they need more stalls rather than urinals. And, you know, they have smaller bladders and therefore they need to go to the bathroom more often and et cetera, et cetera. I won't get into all the details, but you know them. Um, so equality says men and women should have the same size bathrooms. Equity says women should have bathrooms that are twice as large as the men's bathroom. Why? Therefore, the line moves the same speed. See, equity focuses on the ending point. Equality simply focuses on the starting point. And so I think a lot of our racial um, uh, problems, actually, uh, I think a lot of um, people in power just focus on equality, but a lot of people who are powerless or marginalized focus on equity. And this is why affirmative action is in play. Affirmative action is actually about equity. It's not about equality, right? It's about saying, hey, you know what? Someone who comes from a poor background or a disadvantaged background, like let's say they're trying to get into college admissions. Um, maybe they don't need as high of a test scores or as high of a GPA to get into the same college because guess what? They've had started from way behind. And the fact that they've even gotten to where they are, that sh should count for something, right? In fact, the parable of the workers in the field is about equity, not equality. If you think about it, 
There's some people who came first thing in the morning, other people came last thing at night. They got paid the same. And the people who came in the morning said, that's not fair. And Jesus said, don't tell me what is fair. I determine what is fair, right? It is about equity, not equality. So even people um, on their deathbed who convert uh, get into heaven, just like people who have been Christians their entire life, right? So that's equity. And all right, let's move us to the New Testament. I want to talk about the uh, racism at, in terms of um, our racial reconciliation, uh, using the word reconciliation. I think this is maybe the best definition of mission. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says, In Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So, I want to point out a few things. First of all, God is the main missionary agent here. We're his, merely his partners. But uh, God is reconciling the world to himself, and he's calling us to be agents of reconciliation to others. So we need to partner with him in his mission. Colossians 1, 19 to 20 also says, For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So he breaks dividing walls. He reconciles not just uh, humanity, but also the entire cosmos. So uh, reconciliation is really restoring the broken relationship. Now, what are some uh, relationships that have been broken? Well, race, class, and gender are all part of it. Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, that's race, slave nor free, that's class, and male nor female, that's gender. For all, you are all one in Christ Jesus. So, this is really important that we see that this is not like liberation theology. These are biblical Pauline categories. And in case you're not convinced, uh, you see this further in Ephesians and Colossians, not just Galatians. So in three of his epistles, he actually says race, class, and gender, right? You need to be reconciled um, in all three of those. Uh, in Ephesians and Colossians, he actually adds a fourth category, which is age. And then in Ephesians, you also see the fifth category, or maybe it should be the first category, which is God and sinners. That's the vertical reconciliation. Uh, race, gender, class, and age are horizontal uh, reconciliation. But this is basically the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment, love God and love neighbor. And God is basically saying, hey, the vertical reconciliation is the greatest one of all. Okay? Uh, there's... No greater gap than that between God and sinners. And God is saying, if you do not reconcile um, with your neighbor, which is a smaller uh, gap, God is saying, why should I reconcile with you, which is an even greater gap? Or to put it another way, um, if you understand the depths of how God reconciled to you, you need to reconcile with your neighbor, because there's no racial, gender, class, or age difference, uh, which is as great as the gulf between us and God. So um, if we truly understand the gospel, we need to reconcile in those other ways, which means churches need to look at this, okay, in, in this way. Churches need to um, uh, be reconciling in all four of these ways. Um, let's take a look at the church in its infancy. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, you have the coming of the Holy Spirit and the founding of the church. And, you know, some people think that Pentecost was a reversal of Babel. Well, it wasn't. It was a redemption of Babel. Because Babel scattered the languages. And if you reverse that, that means all of humanity would have to be, speak one language again. Or become one race again. But God doesn't do that. He actually says, uh, he allows everyone to remain their different ethnicities and nationalities and languages and cultures. But he made everyone understand each other in their, their own language. See, this is not unity and uniformity. This is unity and diversity. And so Pentecost was not a reversal of Babel. It was a redemption of Babel. Okay? And because diversity is not a curse, right? Uh, Babel was not a punishment. It was them being forced to do what they should have been doing from the beginning, which was the cultural mandate. Okay, so let's look at the Acts 2 church. Well, it has things like apostles teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, prayers, 
uh, signs and wonders, and uh, sharing all things in common, that's social justice, um, and uh, worshiping together, um, breaking bread in their homes, um, praising God, having favor with the people, and evangelism and growth. But that's still not enough. See, my wife and I, um, we have a son who's about to turn two years old. And is he a human? Absolutely. He has eyes and ears and hands and mouth and brain and feet and everything. But he's not a mature human. He's still growing. So the church, all of these qualities are a church, but it's not a mature church. What is a mature church? Because people always ask, should we be like the early church? And I'm like, depends which early church you're talking about. Acts 2 or Acts 11? I actually say Acts 11. Because do you remember in Acts 10, Peter sees a vision of the sheet with the unclean animals being let down. And he realizes this is an analogy for the Gentiles now coming to faith. And he's flabbergasted by this. He says, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So in Acts 11, Antioch is the first multi-ethnic church in history. Now you might say, what about Acts 2? Acts 2 was all Jews, but from different languages and cultures and nationalities. Acts 11 now has Gentiles. So this is a huge turning point. And guess what? It's also the first time the believers are called Christians. So, you know, I think that multi-ethnicity should be a defining characteristic of Christianity. Um, this is not icing on the cake. This is actually uh, a really necessary part of being a mature church. Now, you can be a church without it, but then you're an immature church, right? Uh, to be Christian is to be multi-ethnic because the, the phrase uh, or the label Christian is associated with a multi-ethnic church. Um, we see this as in Acts chapter two is, sorry, Acts chapter six as well when they chose the deacons. Um, the, they, the 12 apostles who were Hebraic Jews chose seven deacons who were Hellenistic Jews. Okay. Now they were all Jews, but they were different cultures. Now, why is it important? Because the Hellenistic Jewish widows were being neglected in the distribution of the food. And so the Hebraic Jews said, we need to diversify our leadership because diverse leadership will can have the benefit of focusing on diverse others. See, here's the thing. If all the leadership remained Hebraic Jews, they wouldn't have known the needs of the Hellenistic Jews. But choosing leaders who were Hellenistic Jews helped them to see their blind spots. Okay, So some people say, uh, is it really legitimate to choose leaders based on their race or culture? Well, first of all, I think the most important thing is that people have um, holiness as well as skill. Okay, I, I do think that uh, they need to be followers of Christ, as well as uh, competent. But after that, um, I do think that choosing people based on uh, diversity is good because then you will plug up all your blind spots that you originally wouldn't have seen in the global church. And so um, that, you know, these, these seven deacons, they originally came from the 72 uh, and they were chosen based on their culture. So, and I think this can be extrapolated that we need to um, also uh, focus on culture and race as a secondary issue. In fact, um, going all the way to the book of Revelation, uh, there is also culture there. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. Have you ever realized that in Revelation, in the future, in heaven, we're still going to retain our nationality, our, our culture, our race, um, 
our language. Yeah, those are not going to go away. Um, we're not going to become this amorphous, non-racial, non-cultural thing. In fact, um, the diversity of the nations actually proves that God is real and true. And it gives him more glory and honor. John Piper famously said in his missions book, Let the Nations Be Glad, um, that uh, the diversity of God's people actually gives more glory to God than if the people of God were culturally uniform. Look, every culture on, or religion on earth is mainly culturally uniform, right? Hindus are mainly from India. Uh, Muslims are mainly from the Middle East or from Southeast Asia. Um, Mormons are mainly white Americans. <laughs> um, but Christianity is the only uh, religion on earth which there's no particular ethnic majority or cultural group that defines it. And if there truly is a global God, then don't you think he would be, look like this? I think this is one of the greatest apologetics for Christianity. And in fact, if we pray that on earth as it is in heaven, then this is what heaven's going to look like. Let's pray for this to happen on earth as well. Let's bring this to pass. In fact, I sometimes think the church um, majors on the minors and minors on the majors. We focus so much on marriage. Look, in Matthew 22, 30, Jesus says, At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. In other words, in the future, and I'm not saying marriage isn't important, but in the future in heaven, there will be no marriage. Because we're going to be married to the Lamb, okay? Um, but uh, there will be multi-ethnicity. But I feel like here on earth, we don't care that much about multi-ethnicity, but we do care about marriage. And I'm like, maybe we flip those priorities, okay? So, now I want to move here just to a few practical tips um, about uh, current uh, race. And... Um, Let's talk about um, this question. Can people of color be racist? I sometimes have people ask me this. And I say, yes, everyone can be racist. I know some people of color deny that they can be racist, but I'm like, <laughs> look, Christian theology says we're all sinful. We definitely all can be racist. However, I think there are different degrees of racism. And I think that there are three things to consider. Intention power, and structuralism. And I think these make a difference. So let's take a look at this. I've divided this into eight different levels. The top four, I would say, are racism, and the bottom four are called implicit bias. Here's the problem. If you just use the word racist, people all think it's like you're a KKK or a slaveholder or a Nazi. And so people will deny that they're racist. And I'm like, yes, there are no people in that category, but there's also lesser degrees of racism or d implicit bias. And I think we need to acknowledge these things. So number one is the KKK slaveholders and the Nazis, right? And there are still people like that in this world. I don't think most people are like this but there are some, okay? But I think what's important to note is that one, two, three, and four are all intentional. These are people who have intentional hate in their heart towards others. And so uh, number two would be people who are intentional, have power, but don't necessarily benefit from the system. Because look, the laws in America are actually set up to benefit white people. So, um, there are a lot of upper class people of color in America, so they have some sort of power because they have money, but the laws don't necessarily benefit them, but they are intentionally racist towards others. You know, I hate to say this, but a lot of Asians, and especially immigrant Asians, fall into this category. Uh, I'm just going to confess that in, even in my family, I grew up with parents who are immigrants uh, from China and Taiwan who always look down on blacks and Hispanics. And they always said blacks and Hispanics are uneducated, dirty, and criminals. And this really hurt my heart. And uh, so there are definitely number two type people. And my parents were like this. Um, and, you know, even the narrative like, well, we worked hard to, you know, make ends meet. Uh, why can't these um, 
blacks or Hispanics do that. So, um, and they they must be lazy or you know whatnot. That, that these are number two type people. Okay. Now, thankfully, my parents have um, come around, but th this is what I heard growing up. Uh, number three, intentional has no power or benefits from the system. Uh, some lower class whites in America. Um, I think a lot of middle America is like this, right? Whites who are poor, who uh, the laws still benefit from them. And in fact, uh, this is why they still have a lot of political power. And um, But they feel downtrodden in society. But what I want to say to them is, well, if you still have the ability to elect the president of the United States, then you do benefit from the system, okay? Uh, even if you feel poor or downtrodden or you feel like social media is mean to you, okay? So, um, and then number four are people who are intentional, have no power, don't benefit from the system. And so these are some lower class people of color in America. They may not have power or the laws don't benefit them from them, but they still have hatred in their heart towards other races. So number one through four, racism is intentional. But number five through eight, you know what? All of us have implicit bias, okay? Those of us who are not intentionally prejudiced still have implicit bias because we're, we all have original sin in us. Now, look, the, the brain does this naturally. The brain tries to um, uh, reduce things in order to uh, make sense of the world. This is sort of a biological response, okay? There's too much data, you have to simplify things, but simplifying things leads to stereotyping. And this is where implicit bias comes in. We all have it. We cannot deny that we have implicit bias. So number five are those who are not intentionally prejudiced, but you have power and you benefit from the system. Many middle and upper class whites in America. I honestly think that most whites are not intentionally prejudiced, but they do have power and benefit from the system. Um, and they may not know that they benefit from the system, but they do. Um, number six, not intentional, has power, does not benefit from the system. Many middle and upper class people of color in America. So, um, and, um, you know, these are people who may have ethnic minorities who have a lot of money, perhaps, um, but they don't have hatred in their heart towards others, but they don't benefit from the system. But, you know, they might still be thinking about themselves as um, uh, needing to hold on to their own money or their own uh, power, you know, and uh, instead of helping others. Number seven, not intentional, has no power, benefits from the system. These are many lower class whites in America. And um, so, uh, Kind-hearted people maybe are poor, but uh, laws still benefit them, okay? And number eight, not intentional, has no power, does not benefit from the system. Many lower class people of color in America. I put an asterisk there because you might say, how in the world are those people at fault? And I'm like, because in Christian theology, we're all sinful. So we all have unintentional biases within us, even if there's not, they're not intentional, okay? So, and here's the, here's the thing. I think narratives play a big part in implicit bias. Let me give you an example. Um, a black man walks into a store. The store owner suddenly tenses up, watches the black man as he walks around the store, um, to make sure that he doesn't steal anything. Uh, the black man walks out of the store, then the owner relaxes, breathes a sigh of relief. In contrast, white man walks into the store. Um, the store owner doesn't think anything about it unless the, the white man pulls out a gun, right? And robs the store. So um, what's the difference there? Whites are considered innocent until proven guilty. Blacks are considered guilty until proven innocent. See, this is implicit bias. These are things that we may not even be conscious that we're doing. These are narratives that run through our head and heart. And I think this is part of sin infecting us. Even though statistically, actually, um, 
there are uh, maybe not as many um, blacks who actually commit those crimes as we might think. And in fact, uh, most uh, shooters tend to be white males, um, but yet somehow the narrative runs the counter direction, okay? Um, and I think part of our solution is activism. You know, um, I want to say that Martin Luther King Jr., in our narrative of America, we think of him as a very peaceful, peace-loving person. Um, and But people forget this quote from Letters from a Birmingham Jail. Um, he also said this, I must confess that over the past few years, I've been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you and the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of good will is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Wow. I think we need to take that to, to mind. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, um, and, um, and I realize uh, we're running out of time here, so um, let me just uh, try to address a big issue right now, which is Black Lives Matter, okay? Um, Black Lives Matter started in 2012, and by the way, I want to distinguish between the organization and the movement. The organization came after the movement, and I realize the organization may support things that we don't necessarily, as evangelical Christians, support, such as... Uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, issues, okay? But the movement, I think we should support. Um, the idea is that a lot of blacks are disproportionately killed and shot by police. Um, and it started in 2012 with Trayvon Martin, shot by George Zimmerman, and escalated with Ferguson and um, in 2014. Um, and statistically, blacks and brown people are pulled over or killed by police more than any other race, okay? And um, it's this whole, like, implicit bias thing. Uh, cops have more itchy trigger fingers when it comes to blacks. If a white person makes a sudden move, the police officer may give them the benefit of the doubt. But if a black person makes a sudden move, they think that's a gun, and then they will immediately shoot them dead. So that's part of the big issue, and it just goes on and on. I've listed all these names here. Um, and um, But I wanna talk about some responses to Black Lives Matter, okay? Um, when people say Black Lives Matter, um, what they mean is Black Lives also matter. Um, but some people have responded with all lives matter. And I feel like they don't get it. All lives matter are people who just believe in equality. Black Lives Matter are people who believe in equity. And I feel like all lives matter, what, what they're hearing from this is only black lives matter. That's not at all what's meant by it. it. It's black lives also matter. Let me give you an example of this. Let's say someone falls into a hole, breaks their leg, and you're walking by, and they say, help me, I'm hurting. And your response to them is, well, you know what? We're all hurting. <laughs> I mean, that's would be a ridiculous response, right? But that's what All Lives Matter does. It basically says, well, we're all hurting. Black Lives Matter is saying, we're particularly hurting in this time and place. Um, it's triage. Medical triage means that whoever is hurting the most gets the first priority, right? Like, if you have a paper cut, and someone else has a bullet hole, they get to jump the line in front of you, right? Because theirs is more urgent and more severe. And you can't say, wait a minute, that's not fair that they got to jump the line in front of me. Uh, that's, that's triage, okay? Um, 
So I think it's important for us to uh, understand that. And um, so let me just show you a, a cartoon which shows uh, why all lives matter is unhelpful to black lives matter. And this is actually from the Bible. Um, Jesus leaves the 99 sheep to go help the one. But imagine if the 99 sheep have this, um, these signs, all sheep matter, right? Well, Jesus is helping the one in particular need. He's not not caring about the 99, okay? Um, and it says, I found this great quote. When a parent says, I love my son, you don't say, what about your daughter? When we run, walk or run for breast cancer funding and research, we don't say, what about prostate cancer? When the president says, God bless America, we don't say, shouldn't God bless all countries? When a person struggling with what's been broadcast on our airwaves says, Black Lives Matter, we should not say, all lives matter to justify ignoring the real need for change. Here's another uh, cartoon which illustrates this. Jesus says, blessed are the poor, but can you imagine if someone said, no, Jesus, blessed are all the people, right? Uh, so uh, let me just give some uh, tips uh, that I often give to both sides of the racial justice equation. If you are white, and I realize this is mainly an Asian church, but what I say to white people is, if you're white, first listen with humility. Because if you don't, that's when the comments come louder or angrier. Number two, we don't think you're racist on a micro level, but you do benefit from the system. Use your privilege to change the system. In other words, fight for people who have less privilege than you. Number three, don't think that one misbehaving member of another race represents all members of that race. I think sometimes we hear like one black shooter and then we think that all blacks are shooters. Um, but like I said, most school shooters are actually white males, and yet somehow we don't think that all white males are shooters, right? So uh, number four, if you feel hurt, consider that as a potentially good thing for compassion's sake. In other words, I hear sometimes people, white people say, well, I feel judged for my race. I'm like, well, I'm sorry for that, and I, that's not right, but sit on that for a second and say, oh, I feel judged for my race. Maybe that's how... Um, people of color always feel. Uh, now you have some compassion for them, right? Number five, see the bigger picture, a history of injustice, that where people are now is, uh, this is equity, not equality, right? Um, knowing that they have maybe had a lot of uh, hurt in their past. So maybe they've had a lot of poverty in their past. Maybe they've had a lot of oppression in their past leading up to this point. Um, if you're a person of color, I would say it's not just a race issue. Don't let yourself just be defined by color, but by intersectionality, which means you're not just a race, you're also a class, a gender, and you are also an age, those four Pauline categories, and you're also a child of God. So raise yourself above the reductionism that others may put on you. If other people just reduce you to a race, don't reduce yourself to just a race, right? Um, educate, don't overreact at first. We want people who don't get it to understand. I know it's easy to just be angry at people who don't get it, but like you have to be patient. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, Alan, where are you from? Meaning, what foreign country are you from? It just kills me. Asians get this all the time. Like we're the perpetual foreigner. And I'm like, I have to be calm. And every single time, no matter how many times, you know, Jesus says, do you forgive seven times? No, 77 times seven, right? Or uh, keep being patient with people. Uh, number three, everyone is biased to some degree, so don't point fingers only one way, right? We, we all have implicit bias. Also distinguish between whites who are allies versus whites who continue to oppress. So I know sometimes people of color will say all whites are bad or all whites are awful. I'm like, there's a lot of whites who are on our side. So uh, distinguish those from the bad people, okay? I know sometimes whites feel uh, hurt, the ones who are allies, they feel hurt that some people of color vilify all whites. Uh, number four, don't paint all police officers as brutal, even if some are. Look, we need cops. We don't want to like get rid of all police. Um, there are some cops who are uh, people of color as well. Okay, And you two are beneficiaries of a broken system. Like I said, um, we Asians are, you know, living on stolen land, benefiting from free labor of slavery. So 
Um, hopefully today's sermon helps. I realize that we're sort of all over the place. I just gave a whole flyover over the whole Bible, as well as addressed a particular issue today of Black Lives Matter. There's way more to be unpacked here, but um, I pray that this is something which is uh, helpful to you as you uh, make your way in this world today in determining how to enact the kingdom of God. Show.